Hello, Drew Rose, and today we're going to be talking about the phenomenology of the artist, case studies that will help connect the truism, the rational, and the fate of beauty, and a guide to help envision the ontoepistemology, metaphysics, and even socioeconomics described throughout O.G. Rose. Um, many of the papers in the True and the Rational series, um, rather the phenomenology of glimpses, uh, even the book Thoughts, are going to be talking a lot about artists, the experience of, say, being in a jazz um, improvisation, of writing a book, of reading a book, these very interesting experiences. And I think, generally speaking, it is indeed phenomenal phenomenologies that we find in the arts that can be very helpful for exploring these new metaphysics, if you will, say conditionalism, say lack, say AB ontology, which is found in Hegel. And I think it's been unfortunate that philosophy and the arts have separated so much, and they tend to be antagonistic today. I mean, it depends, let's say in academia at least. I mean, online, there's m most certainly a very different atmosphere. But generally, there's um, historically, especially at the beginning of the 20th century, been a kind of antagonism between the arts and philosophy. And I think that's been very problematic because I think artistic experiences can be particularly useful case studies for understanding some of these um, more different uh, ontological possibilities uh, like lack and conditionalism and so on and so forth. Um, and this paper, which is featured toward the beginning of Reconstructing ASA Part 1, is to point out some ways, some different case studies uh, that might be useful, um, e even if some of the terms are ones that readers or listeners are not familiar with. I wanted to offer imagery pretty early in the book so that it was almost like there was a hook waiting for people to hang their hat on. Um, there was already a schema, a metaphoric, um, metaphoric schema and imagery that would help people get the papers when they got to the papers or when they heard the ideas for the first time. Um, I, think it's, I think metaphors matter and I think metaphors are very useful and although metaphors are dangerous because they can direct thought in ways that isn't justified because metaphors are so powerful, at the same time they can be used for good and they can help us understand and internalize ideas that otherwise we would miss. So, for example, the paper will start with Lack, which is discussed in the Philosophy of Lack series with Dr. Last, Ebert, Mr. Adlin. Um, and the idea here is when you go to write a novel, what's very interesting is your already at the end of it, you see the whole, and yet you don't see the whole at the same time. There's this reality that's missing, and yet also there when you go to write a story, when you go to, say, compose music. You're in this um, already not yet, to use language from N.T. Wright, and it's also kind of a present absence, whereas the completed novel that you're writing is there, and yet it's also not there. It's not merely nothing, though, because it is indeed very present, but it is a present absence. And similarly, when we talk about lack in the series, there the where your um, where there's a certain desire for say return to the womb or a certain wholeness, it's not merely nothing because you feel it lacking. Whereas you know this ultimate wholeness that we talk about in the philosophy of lack series is not something you can ever ultimately achieve. It is in a sense it's like a it's like a story you're trying to write that you can never finish. And the experience of writing a novel, I think, it does a very good job when you think about that of of thinking about what lack is like and what it's like to operate according to lack and to integrate with lack. Um, whereas here, say, if we're dealing with lacks that we can never ultimately fulfill, um, the, the, it's, it's an example where you can never, say, finish the novel that you're writing, but you are, in fact, operating um, according to a thing that is there and not there. So there are differences in the metaphor, but thinking about lack in terms of the creative act as living according to something that's not there and yet you can still envision and that you can still feel and that you can also organize and live your life according to. Uh, when you envision an idea for a novel, it's not in the world and yet you can go to the store, buy the laptop, drink your coffee, take walks, think you can completely organize your life around the creative act. Um, and that, I think it, that really, really is what ends up happening with lack. It's, it's a present absence that you organize life according to. Another 
subject that comes up a lot in O.G. Rose is A.B. ontology. This is alluding to Hegel. This is the integration with otherness that we see between self-consciousness and reason. And I think A.B. ontology, which also gets into kind of A.B. identity, is quite useful because we see that in the art, the artist, right? They'll work in a coffee shop. They'll work at a restaurant, but they won't identify themselves totally with their job. Yes, they are a barista, but they're also a writer. They're not just a barista. Whereas many other people say they are more so their job. They identify more closely with it, whereas the artist in the socioeconomic order often is in this interesting double role where they're a writer, but they're also working a job. So there's a doubleness that's going on. Similarly, uh, when, say, Faulkner is writing The Sound and the Fury, it's interesting because he talks about Caddy as if she's real, as if she actually is there. And they're in Heming you know, like Hemingway talks as if the individuals in for whom the bell tolls are flesh and blood, that they're really there. And you also see, say, dancers and actors will become their characters. It's not merely that they are acting. They, they, it's like they become the characters. Uh, and in this way, we see an A.B. ontology. They are here as, um, you know, Hemingway is here as Hemingway. But he is also, when he's writing his book, in a world where For Whom the Bell Tolls is real. You know, Faulkner is part of this world where there is no caddy, but he's also part of a world where caddy is very real. And the artists, and really to go through with their work, really, really have to believe in some strange way that their artistic creations are real. So you can't reduce the world for, say, Faulkner to his immediacy, even if though there's a sense in which the immediacy is the most, you know, tangible, hard facticity. There's also a way in which Faulkner is, he's in the world, but not of it, to use that uh, religious language. And there's a kind of self-forgetfulness, to use Timothy Keller's language, um, which I'm very, very much a fan of, in the creative act, where Faulkner forgets himself, and he's just there with Caddy, Quentin, Jace, and Benji, and the Compton family. So we see the artist is often operating in an A-B ontology. They are here, but they're also in something other. They're part of this world, but they're also part of another world. And there's also, um, I think, a humility and bravery involved in creativity that requires you to open up to these worlds. You don't know where they're going to take you. You don't know what the muse is going to demand of you. And indeed, facing otherness and opening oneself up to otherness, like in Hegel, which is also obviously overlays with accepting and integrating with lack, which ties into Lacan and the threat of the real, um, there's a bravery in being willing to encounter more and more of the real, and even if we can't ultimately handle all of it, there is a bravery that goes into handling any of it. And so I think also the, the courage to create, there overlays with the courage to accept A-B ontology. The next case study that's going to be the go with lack, because all of these are, are going to have overlay because they're dealing with the same new uh, ontological, metaphysical, epistemological reality that we're trying to describe in the work of O.G. Rose and that, uh, that others are working on as well. You have these terms like wholeness with the W in parentheses, incomplete with the I-N in, in parentheses, return with the R-E in parentheses, so on and so forth. Um, these, these are expressions of A-B ontologies and between terms. And the artist is indeed, it's not merely that their novels are incomplete, say, when they're in the middle of writing them, but incomplete. There's a completion found in the act of writing because otherwise if you didn't, you'd be too destabilized to, to see the novel through and yet it's also not done. Um, there, there's a kind of wholeness that you find in doing creative work. And creation is very interesting because if you're creating something, there must be something lacking. Otherwise, you wouldn't create. So to be engaged in creation entails a, um absence. There's, there's something not here. And yet you find a wholeness, W in parentheses, in that absence. Now, there's the wholeness that isn't in parentheses that is dangerous, and it's that Freudian effacement we talk about. But there's also this interesting wholeness with the W in parentheses where you find um, motivation and a uh, willingness to keep going in the creative act. And likewise, you find it, there's an incompleteness. You find completeness in always dealing with something that's incomplete. Because there's also the fact that, you know, the, the story of The Sound and the Fury never actually comes into reality. It's not like Caddy ever becomes a real person in the world. Um, so there is an ultimate failure, if you will. I mean, the creator cannot actually create. Um, Shakespeare can't actually make a flesh and blood person called Hamlet. Um, so there's a kind of um, incompleteness, an ultimate incompletion in the creative act. And yet, 
um, you still find completeness in that failure, if you will. So you're failing better. You're dying better, to use Dr. Last's language. And so again, terms like wholeness, incompleteness, return, all in parentheses, I think we see in the creative act. Um, and, and thinking of the life of the artists and the, the ultimate goals that they try to accomplish can help us understand what those terms are getting at. Um, the here thereness that is described in the absolute choice and also in the paper on absolute knowing is this is um, and, and certainly that book even directly describes this. You know that weird experience when you go to read a book. You open it and you're reading these black this black ink on white ink on white paper and yet you have a movie playing in your head. I've always found this to be one of the most remarkable experiences where you as a human being are sitting on a chair and yet you're also with Frodo climbing up Mount Doom, right? Like you're here and there at the same time. I think this here thereness is incredibly philosophically rich. I think it has implications for imagination and memory, as hopefully the paper on thinking here and thinking there um, gets into. And I think here thereness is also a good description of the state of absolute knowing, where you know that you are limited, uh, you accept that you are here, um, unable to, to, there's a certain limitation to what you can realize and think, which would also mean there's a thereness. And you have to integrate with that um, divide and find yourself um, living according to a here thereness, which is a kind of lack, uh, and to find your identity in that. And I think humans primarily exist here, there, not just here, not just there, but, in a, but often in a bothness that is a B. Um, the next category is language. Uh, language is ex incredibly important. Uh, the ability to, say, read a word and think of a reality that is not present is described throughout O.G. Rose. Um, and our, see, artists understand that, say, blue and azure or, or slain, these are not equivalent. They all mean blue, a tint of blue, but they're not the same. Uh, language completely transforms. Uh, the, the language that you use in a sentence impacts the um, image that is in your head or the experience you have of, of the artistic work. Um, and so there's, so it's very particular what language that you use. If there's a word misspelled and you're reading a book and you encountered a misspelled word, you can suddenly be pulled out of the movie in your head into the book. And so language, um, language points to uh, the ways that human beings are metaphysical, that they are operating according to signifiers that are not find, found in the signified and yet are necessary to make the world intelligible. Um, and, and so, for example, the difference between wholeness and wholeness, you know, you can't hear it, but on this, you know, on a piece of paper, you could have wholeness without parentheses and wholeness with parentheses. And what that is getting at is very, very different. Um, there's a entire process of negation sublation. You are negating wholeness without a parentheses and sublating it into wholeness within parentheses. Um, so you're taking a concept, you're using the same word, but it, but it has a new meaning. And so... It, it's, it's, it's important to realize that transformation in languages are really directly tied to transformation in our philosophy. You can't just use any language. Uh, it, it matters very much. And language, I think, also does point to ways that humans are uniquely AB entities that make the world intelligible according to things that cannot be found in the world. Another very important category of thought in O.G. Rose is conditionalism, which is between absolutism and relativism. Um, conditionalism is meant to suggest that there are concrete truths and reality which arise when the right conditions are met. Um, they're not universal, they're not non-contingent, but they're very tangible, like a shadow, and that's in regard to Tanasaki. You have to have an object blocking light, or you have to have a lack of artificial lighting, and then you can have shadows and you create a certain atmosphere that has a certain um, vibe. So can, when c certain conditions are met, you have certain experiences. And those experiences are very real. They're not just subjective. They're, they're very tangible. They are there. And I think the lack of conditionalism from philosophy has really hurt it because it basically has just been trapped between, say, objectiz objectivity and subjectivity or absolutism and relativism. Um, the writer, the painter, all of the different artists, creators um, are very well aware that their book or their painting must meet certain conditions to create an uh, emotional effect. If, um, if the painting is low quality, it probably won't move the viewer. If the writer is careless in the sentence construct, uh, it, might, it might be jagged, it might not be elegant, and that's going to mess up the emotional effect. The writer could have the best story in the world, but if the sentences themselves are not elegant, then a condition will not be met that is necessary for the reader to have a powerful aesthetic experience. And so, I mean, artists 
artists are completely in the business of realizing that they have to meet certain conditions to create certain effects that they want to to make. And so creators are very well aware of conditionalism. And, and also, too, they're aware that they could write a really good book, but if someone doesn't have personal experiences of a certain kind, they won't resonate with the creative work. So, you know, your audience is people who have met certain conditions that can therefore um, resonate with, with your work. So artists and creators are very much in the business of conditionalism. And I think philosophy, actually philosophy has a lot to do with the arts, as we've been alluding to, as an art form more than a science. And that's not to say that um, science is bad or that philosophies of science or with philosoph or scientific considerations are, are not good. But um, philosophy, I think, is often moving between um, ontologies or vectors, to use language from Mr. Bard and Mr. Alung, and the interplay between those, between those vectors. Whereas science tends to be focused on a single vector or a single ontology, and, it's in, and science is very, very important. Um, but it's, and it's actually not very natural to try to think well or systematically or dis with discipline across vectors and ontologies, whereas philosophy would train us to do that. And the artist is in the business of working across ontologies. You're, you're using you know, physical marks on paper, physical paper, to create something that's mental, an image in the head. So there's, there's an interplay of vectors or ontologies going on. Uh, the, the paper will also talk about dialogos, participatory knowledge, philosophical practices, and the like. You know, the topic of dialogos is coined by John Bavaki, and it's something that's discussed throughout the internet, these intellectual internet circles. And dialogos is this conversation that emerges, this, this kind of interaction that emerges between people that can't be located in any one person. There are ideas that you never had before that you have once you enter into the conversation. It's the interplay of the different minds. And it's very interesting because... It, it's almost um, as if anything goes in dialogus, and yet that's not the case. There, there are good answers, there's bad answers, there's listening, there's um, replying that's better than others. So, but to really get dialogus, you have to be in it. The same goes for participatory knowledge or, say, the um, Panier's uh, personal knowledge that he'll describe. You have to be in it to get it. Very similar to a jazz improvisation, and this is elaborated on in labels, names, and poems. Um, you, it's not the, it seems in a jazz improvisation that anything goes, but there really are right notes to play at right times. There are certain times where the drums, um, the drums should fade. There are certain times where the piano should change keys. It's not anything goes, and yet it seems like anything goes. And yet it's also extremely difficult to explain why the um, piano played what it did when it did and how the pianist knew, and yet he did know. It, it's very concrete. He did know. Um, maybe there was a range of options, but it wasn't merely anything goes. Uh, but you have to be in the jazz improvisation to get it. And jazz improvisations, uh, in, in other forms, uh, comedy improvisation, so on, these can help us understand particip participatory knowledge and philosophical practices that are being highlighted, highlighted in the internet today. Um, so anyway, the Phenomenology of the Artist is a collection of case studies to help us explore some of the new um, philosophical, metaphysical, epistemological, um, ontological concepts that are being explored today. I think they are very useful metaphoric schemas to help us get a grasp of, of these ideas. And, and hopefully, with these ideas in mind and this imagery in mind, as we progress through O.G. Rose and the work that is found there, it will be easier to get, um, to get the concepts that are more analytical and straightforward uh, when they're lacking imagery and lacking metaphor. And, and hopefully, the, this work and this kind of imagery and these metaphoric examples will help make the work of O.G. Rose clearer and easier to grasp. There is also the distinction on thinking and perceiving, which artists know very well, which is, you know, Flannery O'Connor once said, the writer can't be afraid to stare, and you have to stare very closely at the world and really see it. And it's funny that we very rarely actually see what's in front of us. And that's a point you find in Nishanti and uh, Suzanne that would stress that. And you really have to really perceive, and when you perceive strongly and actually get your thoughts and um, distract your, your, your noisy mind out of the way, you can really perceive and see the world very well, which then dialectically transforms thinking in powerful ways. And that distinction between perceiving and thinking will prove very important as we move forward in reconstructing A as A. For more by OG Rose, please visit ogrose.com, YouTube, Twitter, Anchor, um, Instagram, so on and so forth. All likes, shares, um, uh, follows are greatly appreciated. And thank you so much for your time.